And so our team will be there to answer questions and take input from the community. In addition, we will have a budget workshop on Wednesday, May 22nd here in the council chamber, and that's at 6 p.m. One of the things I wanted to announce was that uh, a solar app, and so we have a pilot program for solar permits that's underway, which means that contractors get solar permits and acquire them through the automated solar app program. And this is as a result of a grant that we received and applied for, um, and that was back in 2023, and so online applications for all are expected to be available by summer. Mark your calendars for May 31st. We have an economic mobility symposium that's going to bring together uh, diverse uh, thought leaders exploring economic mobility with a specific emphasis on tackling the barriers faced by Spanish-speaking community members and assessing housing, education, and career opportunities, as well as nurturing a feeling of inclusion on their path towards upward mobility. More information in the link to purchase tickets can be found on our website. I mentioned Sidewalk Saturdays earlier as it relates to our budget, just to note that this is uh, happening every Saturday, every second Saturday of the month, April through December from 10 to 3. Uh, we had our last one just recently. It includes a closure of 3rd Street, partial closure, uh, 45 plus vendors, um, and, as well as live music. This past weekend, the Morgan Hill was alive and well with lots of activities. We had Earth Day, we had Santa Clara Valley Beautify, we had Rotary doing a project. One of the other things that we're very excited about is we had our indoor adaptive play program kick off, and that was our first session over at the CRC. And so this program was a huge success with dozens of participants and several supporters. Um, so we want to thank the Morgan Hill Kiwanis Club that has supported the initiation of this project uh, with $5,000 worth of equipment. And then additional thanks goes to the San Andreas Regional Center for support, community member Enrique Flores for bringing the ideas forward and providing support, as well as community volunteers Sean and Tricia, a parent for working to set up the program. So this is for families with kids from about two to five special needs that just need a, a more quiet, sensory, friendly environment indoors. And so that we're excited about that Saturdays and Thursdays as well. Several other events I wanted to mention, uh, mark your calendars for May 4th, our Arnold Cards, May 11th, the Open Streets, May 18th uh, is our Family Health and Wellness Fair. So this is um, really fun. I think this is the second annual uh, 10 to 2. Um, and so this is at the CCC with performances, health screenings, family resources, workshops, and more. And then on May 22nd, we have Public Works Week events. And so we're going to be celebrating Public Works uh, Week and a free event where you can meet our Public Works employees, see equipment demonstrations, and learn about the role public work professionals play in our everyday life. And then lastly, for events, uh, May 31st uh, at 6 o'clock here at the Civic Center Lawn, we will have our Pride Flag Raising Ceremony. All of these events and more can be found on our website as well as in our 411. And then one final shout out, Robert will appreciate this one as our photographer for the Panthers. The Panthers are not only our national champions from last year, but they're currently undefeated at 4-0. The next game is Sunday, April the 28th, and that will be in San Diego against the San Diego Strike Force. I think that's Saturday. Uh, Saturday. According to the website, it's Sunday, April 28th. Oh, very good. She's okay. Yeah. So. And we got two Sunday games. With that, I conclude my report. Very good, thank you. Uh, City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it seems like a long time ago, but on March 6th, the council met in closed session in the matter of Cerna versus City of Morgan Hill. There was no report of election, and that's my report. Very good, thank you. Any other reports? I've got a couple, I've got a couple things that, uh, based on the uh, committees that I serve on. First of all, I would like to thank the Morgan Hill Rotary Club for this past Saturday. Uh, uh, volunteers from the Morgan Hill Rotary Club uh, planted 30 trees uh, in the community park near the Magical Bridge Park. So that uh, that took place. Uh, it's sort of a mobility partnership, and again, we're learning that the 101-25 interchange phase one is fully funded, and that work is to begin. Uh, it's slated to begin in early 2025, and should be completed by the end of 2027. Uh, again, for phase one. Also on BTA, BTA, learn some information, BTA is ranked in the top five among the nation's largest transit uh, transit agencies in ridership growth with 25 million riders aboard buses and light rail trains in 2023. 
The ATA board also decided to send a letter opposing SB 1031, which is a bill aiming at consolidating all of the uh, transit operators in the Bay Area. Uh, and they wanted to do that by 2027. SB 1031 would also give uh, a look uh, to raise between 750 and two, 750 million dollars and two billion dollars through taxes. And so uh, the uh, ETA board chose to oppose that at this point in time. Caltrain, since the adoption of the fourth train uh, in South County, ridership has increased by 38 percent, equaling an additional 138 daily trips. System-wide, weekday ridership increased by 26 uh, percent over that same period of time, so we did see some an increase in ridership. I serve on the Cities Association, and we received in our last meeting a presentation from the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority, also called BAFA, uh, regarding a regional affordable housing bond they're looking to try to get on the ballot in November. Uh, this bond could raise up to $20 billion, also through taxes. Uh, they would, the idea is that they would build and preserve uh, 72,000 affordable housing units across nine counties. All the housing would be deed restricted, uh, and the, the bond could bring in, uh, for what it means for Santa Clara County, is one to two billion dollars specifically for San Jose's efforts, and then an additional 1.2 to 2.4 billion to Santa Clara County. The County Board of Supervisors would decide where that money goes, but they can also decide out of that 1.2 to 2.4 billion that would be set aside for the rest of the cities in Santa Clara County, some of that money could also be allotted to go to San Jose in addition to what they already get. The Silicon Valley Regional Interoperability Authority, at our last meeting we approved the budget, and each member agency will see increases in their contributions to the SBRIA due to funding uh, the asset replacement reserve to support strategic life cycle, uh, life cycle planning for their radio infrastructure, increased insurance premiums, and contractually agreed, contractually agreed to long-term service contracts. So we'll be seeing that. Uh, I just attended the League of California Cities, the City Leaders Conference in Sacramento. They have four advocacy priorities for 2024. It is number one, safeguard local revenues and bolster local economic development. Number two, strengthen climate change resiliency and disaster preparedness. Number three, improve public safety in California communities. And number four, expand investments to prevent and reduce homelessness and increase the supply of affordable housing. And all through those three days we were there, there was a number of conversations and panels being uh, discussing all of these topics with different ideas and an opportunity to meet with state legislators uh, to talk more about those, uh, those issues. I've been working on something here uh, called the, uh, when I was in Gilroy as the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, I worked with Visit Gilroy to develop a uh, trail, we called it the Taco Trail, to support and promote the 20 plus Mexican restaurants that we had in our, when I became mayor here, I thought there's gotta be something we can do in our community and I didn't want to duplicate the Taco Trail. So I landed on the idea of a guacamole trail, which we will call the Guac Walk. And so I uh, got in touch with uh, Krista Rupp from uh, Visit Morgan Hill, began working with her early in the process. I began visiting the Mexican restaurants here in town and asked if they would like to be a part of this, but also discovered I needed some help. And so I was able to get uh, Maria Sanchez here in town and also Yori, uh, Yori Cortado to go with me. Uh, they can speak Spanish and help uh, communicate with some of these owners. And we have 15 Mexican restaurants, all 15 in our community that are on board, plus region market. And so it is, we're gonna call it the Guac Walk. And what we're thinking of also adding to that is July 31st is uh, National Guacamole or National Avocado Day. And then there's also February's National Avocado Month. We thought, hey, we'll do a, we'll do a guacamole contest and we'll call it the Guac of Fame. So we're just gonna have some fun with this. And it's just a kind of a fun way of promoting, promoting our Mexican restaurants. And so I think Visit Morgan Hill will be actively involved in that promotion and process. And, I don't think the city will pick any of this up and help promote as well, but I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. We'll probably really get this going here in the next week or two. It's, we'll circle back with all the restaurants and tell them, hey, we're, we're, we're launching it. So this will be really a year-round promotion uh, just to get people you know, to these restaurants to experience what's happening there and to, to bring more customers to those restaurants. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And then, I don't know, uh, uh, Christina, if you mentioned the Mushroom Festival, May 25th and May 26th. Out for that as well. That is it for me. Uh, we will now go to public comment. This opportunity for public comment is for items that are not on the agenda. If you'd like to make comments on an item 
that is on the agenda, please wait until we get to that item to offer your comments. Members of the public are entitled to address the City Council concerning any item within the Morgan Hill Council's subject matter jurisdiction. Public comments are limited to no more than three minutes. Except for <coughs> specific exceptions, the City Council is prohibited from discussing or taking action on any item not appearing on the, uh, on the agenda. Public comment is intended for comments. Questions posed during public comment are not generally answered. And if you have questions, please send them to the city clerk at ccpublickcomment at morganhill.ca.gov to receive a response. Do we have any public comments? I'm Mayor, and I don't see anybody coming up to Oh, very good. I'm just go right to that left and right from you. And you might just need to push the button on the mic. Do you see a red light? Consent calendar. There, uh, in, uh, the council or anyone in the public uh, is not looking to pull any items, then we will go ahead and take a motion to approve. Do we have anybody on the council looking to pull any items? There being none. Anyone in the public? There being none. I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Councilmember Borgioli. Second by Councilmember Spring. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There being none. Passes 4-0. Now on to item 12, public hearing, whole public hearing and tabulate the ballot for Sparhawk uh, sub-area of Morgan Hill Landscape Assessment District number one. Chris, come on down. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Chris Kennedy, Public Services Director. Um, I'm going to do a brief report because you, uh, on your previous agenda, you, uh, the council uh, approved initiating this vote. This is a vote of the Sparhawk sub area of our landscape um, assessment district. So um, what happens tonight is um, we sent out ballots to everyone who lives in the district and they're voting to either raise their assessment or uh, not raise their assessment. Um, how, how the item works is um, open, the council will open the public hearing and, and accept any input or comments on the ballot. And then um, we announce the close of the public hearing. And then after that, um, we will take a quick recess um, and uh, count votes. Um, and then we'll come back with the total. And if it passes, the assessment, the maximum assessment will be increased. And if it doesn't pass, then it will not be increased. Okay. Is there any? Comments by council before opening public comment. Councilmember Borgio. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, do we vote or the people in that um, SPAR vote? Uh, they vote, and many of them have sent in their ballots already. But as you, um, you will 
if this uh, public hearing happens, it will have a final chance to turn in a ballot if anyone's here and it's not turned it in, and then we would become them. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay, then we will open a public, uh, the uh, public comment. Do we have anyone wishing to make comments? There being none, we will close the public comment. Uh, and so at this point in time, we're going to take a five minute break to go ahead and tabulate uh, the votes, at which point we'll report back in five minutes, plenty of time for you. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break. We'll be back here uh, just, uh, just at about 6.45. Um, the one that's a bit more complex is exceptional costs. Um, so exceptional costs are costs that can be um, collected in the year following expenses, and it's the exceptional costs are for things like extra disposal vouchers to help support homeless cleanups or um, compost procurement to comply with 1383, various costs that come up throughout the year that are not included in the agreement. It also includes implementation funds. Implementation funds are funds that we can request from Recology, and um, Recology collects those funds from the ratepayers, and those funds go toward implementation of, of um, like state, local, and federal regulations. So we operate these programs in order to comply with those regulations. So um, this year, our exceptional costs that are included in the rates include compost procurement, which is required under SB 1383, and in addition, the implementation funds. Um, so this year, implementation funds that have been requested and which are included in the rate adjustment is staff resources for compliance with SB 1383, which is mandatory organics recycling, installation of trash capture devices uh, for compliance with the trash state trash mandates, city staffing associated with compliance with 1383 and associated materials, and then costs related to the household hazardous waste program. Um, after doing an internal audit, we get the rate adjustment request, we look at all of the source documents, we make sure all the correct numbers were plugged in in accordance to what's written in our agreement, make sure it's all good to go, and after going through that process, uh, the current proposal, proposed rate adjustment is 5.07% increase this year. Uh, what that means for residential customers is that um, when we apply that rate to basic residential service rate, um, of 4201, it's a $2.13 increase per month, making the maximum permitted monthly charge for Flatland customers $44.14, and the maximum permitted monthly charge for Hillside customers would go up to 4802. For businesses getting a three yard standard dumpster service once a week, the maximum allowable monthly rate rates will rise from $462.15 to $485.58. 
And that concludes my report. I will take any questions. Thank you so much. Any questions by the council? There being none, we'll open for public comments. Any public comments? We'll close, we'll close public comments, and since there likely not be any council discussion, we'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Councilmember Borgioli, second by Councilmember Liebers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? There being none, passes 4 0. Thank you. To other business, uh, item 14, adopt ordinance number 2353, new series authorizing an amendment to the Contract between the City of Morgan Hill and the Board of Administration of the California Public Employees Retirement System. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Michael Orczyk, Human Resources Director. Um, we are bringing back the adoption of the ordinance amending the contract between CalPERS and the City of Morgan Hill as um, presented and discussed at the March 6th meeting. Um, this was part of the negotiation process and would um, allow military service credit to count towards service credit for members of the miscellaneous group. If approved, teammates would be able to purchase service credits beginning May 26, 2024. And the report. That was quick. Thank you. Any questions by the council? There being none, we'll open for public comment. Any public comment? No. Being none, we'll close public comments. Uh, again, with there being no council discussion, I'll uh, make a motion to approve. Uh, motion to approve. Motion by Councilmember Bordiola. Second. Second by Councilmember Spring. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Being none, that passes 4 0. Thank you, Michael. Item 15 Approved Leadership Morgan Hill Project at the Community and Cultural Center. So um, annually, Leadership Morgan Hill um, does a project, often it involves the city. Um, so I'm not going to spend time talking about their project, except that we as staff have worked with them on this project that the class has designed, and they're going to be presenting it to you uh, for approval tonight. With that, I will turn it over to Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council members. Thank you so much for taking the time to review our project. My name is Scott Jeffrey. I'm representing the class of 24 for Leadership Morgan Hill. And I'm here to talk about our leadership project. So, um, <clears throat> so the CCC in the Splash Zone is a, a community area used uh, for a variety of events. In the summertime, the kids are splashing and playing in the area. It's a nice place to relax. We've got the Friday night concert series there. And our project is designed to improve uh, that area and make it more user-friendly, uh, make it um, more approachable for families to spend time, um, and to really improve the aesthetic of the area. Um, we're going to be adding seating and some surrounding items, uh, which I'll get into in, in a little bit. Um, with these improvements, we're actually able to create a space that the city then can rent out for parties, uh, providing another revenue stream similar to the magical bridge in other areas uh, within the city. Um, and so you can see kind of the current space as it exists today and our vision for the future of what this space will look like. In terms of the details of the improvements that we're recommending to be made is we're going to relocate the existing benches. We've got the square, the, the square stones. We're going to relocate those, reuse those uh, in other areas. And we're going to install five concrete picnic tables. Uh, two of them will be ADA accessible. 
Um, this will provide uh, seating areas for dining if you're having lunch and the kids are splashing. Just a nice place to, to, to sit and, and have a little bit more accessibility there. Uh, we'll be planting two new trees. Our existing trees will be adding a couple more for extra shade over the area. They'll be consistent with the trees that exist in the space currently. Uh, we'll be adding an animal sculpture. It's a turtle designed to kind of go with the aquatic theme and to, to give a little bit of, a, of a, an attraction for the kids and, 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 and adults alike. Um, we'll have a freestanding plaque embedded on a uh, rock uh, that will detail uh, the name of the new space. We'll be uh, naming this new area as well as um, the leadership Morgan Hill details and potentially some sponsor uh, uh, information as well. And then finally, we'll be adding a single row of bricks uh, for sponsors, um, color to match the overall aesthetic. Um, and be relatively discreet. That area does have um, some some bricks that are already kind of inscribed on, so we didn't want to we didn't want to be overly uh, um, apparent with those. And, and, and on the next slide here, I've got a layout of the proposed design. The two existing trees are on either end of the grassy area. We'll be adding the two new ones in the middle. Uh, we've got the turtle sculpture and the plaque as outlined here. Um, tables evenly spaced and then the sponsor bricks, single row, four by eight bricks, again very discreet and laid right into the grass there. Um, that will enable us to help to, to fund the program uh, so that we can deliver on our vision. So that is kind of a high level overview of our plan and our proposal. And uh, in terms of the schedule of, and activities uh, that we, we're, we're planning on, we do expect the project to com be completed by September. Um, although we are optimistic that we can potentially uh, deliver it by early August, gives us a couple more Friday night concerts and a little bit left of the summer for the community to be able to utilize it. Um, just in terms of logistics and details, um, it's fairly straightforward. The tables we've worked with the city to, to order through an existing vendor. The trees are being donated by a local nursery, Double Mountain Nursery. Um, the animal sculpture is available from a nearby vendor. And um, the plaque, we have the stone in possession. Uh, and we'll inset a plaque on that once we've determined uh, what the contents of that plaque will be. Uh, as far as the activities themselves, the table and the tree installation will be performed by the city, uh, will be funded by a leader cl a leadership class. Uh, we'll work with them to install both the trees uh, and the tables. And the plaque, the turtle, and the bricks uh, will be installed uh, by Favors by Design. So Bob, who's a classmate of ours, uh, will be making an in-kind donation to do all of the installation activities for those components. So with that, uh, I appreciate your time and look forward to your questions. Great presentation, Scott. Thank you. I had a quick question. You, you talked about renaming that area. Is that a, can you tell us what you're, you're thinking about renaming? So the class has currently uh, submitted their nominations. We'll be discussing it and, and coming up with our ideas and uh, happy to share that once we've made a final turn. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions by Council Member Liebers? Uh, I'm not aware that it even has a name right now. I, I think it is unnamed, so we will we will give it a name, and that will allow it to be uh, rented out by the city and, and have an official designation. Thank you, Councilmember Spring. Yeah, and thank you. Well, first of all, I applaud the leadership class of 2024, the second best class ever, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for doing the project. Marilyn and I were in the 2012 class. That and was Michelle. Was, and Michelle uh, in the 2012 leadership class. So no, that indeed was. Uh, uh, the, what, what I'm questioning a little bit is the budget. The, the, you, you say the class plan is about 10,000. How realistic is that? That seems on the lower end to me of what you're trying to do. So our budget is actually 15,000. We work with the board to uh, get an approval for an increase uh, to uh, accommodate all the activities. So we do believe that the 15,000 is uh, realistic and achievable, and we believe our fundraising activities will allow us to raise that money. Okay, I, I apologize, I'm referring to the staff report in front of me. And that um, yeah, that, that is a little bit more realistic. Um, have you started fundraising already? So we're kicking off fundraising activities this week. We've just sort of designed our fundraising program, and we're starting to work with the events that we'll have, where we will have presence. The businesses will be outreaching to and a variety of other activities. So um, we, we, we plan to begin in earnest. We have had some conversations already with, with certain uh, people that are interested, um, some potentially higher value donors. Uh, so we're optimistic we can secure those funds. Um, but the full public outreach will begin uh, probably in the next week or so. 
again, speaking from our own experience, uh, include, that included the planting of trees too. Uh, uh, as simple as it sounds, uh, whenever you deal with agencies, it's never a fast process. Uh, how realistic is your timeline? timeline? So uh, I think the, the city, we, 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 excuse me, we were working with Chris uh, to outline the, the installation activities. The trees we've been uh, communicating to that is fairly straightforward. Planting up the trees, ensuring that they're, they're established. They're not large trees, they're, they're smaller trees. Um, tables is literally just forklifting the wood, <coughs> so there doesn't seem to be too many logistics there. Um, and then, again, with the brick installation, that's probably the brick and the turtle installation are probably the two larger items. Um, and so we've been maintaining close contact with Chris's team, and Bob has done multiple site visits, planning it out, doing some pre-planning. So um, the devil is obviously in the details, and once we get into the timelines and once we know how many bricks and those sorts of things, we'll have a better idea of the actual schedule. But um, we'll be keeping close tabs on this to make sure that we can meet our timeline. Right, the, the Chris, uh, maybe it's something you might change on me, but because uh, I do remember how you struggled uh, was because the, the trees need watering. And, and if that's not, in, it might be in place in that area, but if it's not in place, this is not something that is. So the way we were able to do it um, is the trees are in the grass, so we have the grass as water, and that doesn't work on its own, um, as you might be aware of what we do is we put these pipes that go down that help take the water that's watering the grass and feed the bottom of the roots. So what that does is it doesn't require a, a uh, separate irrigation system. So um, so that, that that's the plan for the trees to get out of there. So based upon what you know and what you discuss with the class, is, is that timeline realistic? Uh, yeah, they, they seem to be moving along, um, and I think I think it is realistic. Okay, great. No further questions. Thank you so much. I'm excited to see it happening. Hey, I know. Real quick, do you got some other classmates here with you? Can we have them stand and be recognized? Oh. All right. Project, um, you should be real proud of yourself. Every year, I see a project being brought forward, and each of them are tremendous assets to uh, the community and to Morgan Hill. So, uh, thank you for coming up with that, uh, that design and everything. And I just one correction, though, um, I have to disagree with my colleagues. Um, so, the, the class of two thousand. Three, four was the best class. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go to open public comment. Do we have any uh, public comments on the side? Okay, we'll close the public comment. There being no further council discussion, uh, we will look to get a motion to approve uh, early 15.1, the recommendations to approve leadership on your project. And number two, offer the city manager to execute agreements as needed with leadership for his bill uh, and contracts to complete the installation. Do I have a motion? So moved by Council Member Spring. Second. Seconded by Council Member Borgio. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? copies of all photo identifications and driver's license and passport for each owner and employee. And then color copies of massage, California Massage Therapy Council ID card and the certification for each therapist. These additionally, uh, with the new permitting process, there's new operational standards as well. Once the facility is operational uh, and it does have, it has, it's been permitted and it has uh, a business license, there are new operational standards. Uh, no front store windows may be blocked with the use of curtain blinds or tints, so you must have visibility into the premises. And the revocation of the massage permit shall result in immediate cease of operations by the massage establishment, and it will disqualify the massage owner from being issued a future massage establishment permit in the city of Morganville. 
and then a final order to revoke a massage permit can result in a moratorium period where no other massage establishment shall be permitted to operate at that location by any person for a period not less than five years. So we're talking about that location, that shopping center, uh, that landlord not being able to release to a new massage tenant. So the permitting process, uh, it will, it's, um, they need to complete the massage establishment permit application. It's uh, that correspondence, that documentation is submitted to the Morgan Hill Police Department. It takes about a 30 to 60 day review, 30 to 40 days uh, review period to ensure all the documentation is, is accurate and complete. Um, there's no change in the business license fee for massage establishments. Uh, the massage establishment permit will be issued by the Morgan Hill Police Department prior to the Morgan Hill, the massage establishment receiving a business license. So they go through the permitting process. Once that permit is approved, then they can get their business license. And the permit, the massage uh, permit must be renewed every year as a condition of the business license renewal. So it's a two-step process. So currently there are 17 existing massage establishments citywide, and there are four new massage establishments currently being routed through the, through the new process. Um, as of uh, yesterday, uh, and through our outreach, there have been five total massage establishment permit applications Committed with a new process, three from existing operators and two from two new operators. There are also two uh, operators who have already been approved as well. So uh, the economic development team has been very targeted in our outreach on March 20th. We sent a notice to all uh, massage establishment permit processes. They were emailed uh, to the owners and to the property owners uh, that are currently operating and then the ones who are applying for new licenses. We reached out to them as well and told them about the new process. And then on March 29th, the notice of the new massage establishment <coughs> permit was hard copied via U.S. mail uh, to the same group of business uh, operators and to the property owners. Uh, the economic development team has talked to two property owners who have massage establishments in their facility, in their uh, commercial properties, and they have no issue with our approach uh, and our certification process and the potential moratorium uh, if, a, if there is a uh, moratorium that's required. So tonight's recommendation is to waive the first and second reading of the ordinance and then introduce the new ordinance replacing Chapter 532, massage establishments and professional permit requirements. Uh, I am not the subject matter expert on this topic. Uh, this effort really came together as an effort uh, really between uh, economic development who's been involved in uh, the business license process and trying to streamline the business license process. Brittany Sherman has really uh, been on the tip of the spear with that and working with code compliance, uh, planning, and PD. So it's been really a, a team effort. So I'm here uh, hoping just to get this across the finish line tonight. So with that, I'll take your questions and may call the friend for help. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, everybody's got questions. Even I guess we'll go uh, first with uh, Council Member Leavers. Um, my question is, um, what will be the enforcement for the, once this is done? Is it, will there be monthly checks or just drive-bys? Or how are they going to you know, manage this? So our, our code enforcement, so first of all, uh, we're the economic development team is working uh, with the police department to go through this initial permitting process. So, you know, we have 21, 17 plus four new ones, 21 businesses that need to go through this permit process. And they need to have this new permit approved before July 1. So they now have almost 60 days to get through that process. So if those businesses are not in compliance by July 1, they will not receive a business license and will not be allowed to operate in the city of Morgan County. So that's the first step. The second step is ongoing code enforcement, uh, which our code enforcement team uh, does on a regular basis. They've been going out and visiting uh, massage parlors. They don't make, you know, they make unannounced visits. Um, and there have been, uh, working with PD, they've gone in together on some of these visits with code enforcement and the PD together 
and there have been in the past there have been sting operations as well. So it's ongoing enforcement. Thank you. I want to jump in real quick because I want to play off what you just asked. With regards to previous uh, concerns and inappropriate activities that we've been uh, made aware of, how, how will this process help to monitor and mitigate those concerns? I mean, I get, I get the sting operations. That seems like we've done that in the past. Is there anything you do here that will help us to monitor this? Yeah, I think the biggest step is the certification process to make sure that uh, each therapist that's working within these establishments is certified with the California Massage Therapy Council, that they do have a certification, they do have a license. That's the biggest step. Uh, I think what we found is many folks don't have that documentation, uh, and this is the first hurdle. So uh, I, I think just making sure that everybody receives their initial permit is potentially going to weed some bad actors out. And, and the biggest change, uh, Mayor, is uh, that, so one of the issues we've had in the past is that we're ready, you know, we've been able to shut down some of the illegal operations, mm -hmm. but they just pop right back up. Right. Um, and many of the owners of these, mm -hmm. um, or the alleged owners of these establishments are um, the, the ones that are operating illegally are um, just straw, straw owners. It, um, and so we um, haven't had the ability to truly shut down the establishments. Um, what happens is we revoke the business license, but somebody can come right back a month later and apply for a new, a new person to apply for a business license for the exact same establishment. So okay. this will prevent those from just popping right back up once we're able to shut them down. Got it. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Spring? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Matt, for the report. I have a couple questions, and I, I apologize if I'm off with my questions here, and I'm trying to be serious. The, the, uh, so is a, is a spa the same as a massage center? Yeah, anybody who provides uh, massage type touch, they have to all have the same requirements. So each spa that's in that same use category uh, has to have the permit. So if a tanning place also provides massage services? If they, if they provide massage services, they are required to have the permit. Do, do, do they know that they fall into this category? We have reached out to everybody. The, um, the, the, the one, one thing that struck me is that the, these um, businesses should not fall, uh, should not block the front windows. If I were a client and, 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 and would go in there, I wouldn't want people from the outside looking that I'm going in there and, and, and that I'm getting a massage that I'm on a table there. Well, it's just the front lobby area where they can't have blinds and the windows can't be covered. So the front lobby area, the, the front windows cannot be covered, but off the bed. The back of the rooms where the actual massages are taking place, obviously, you know, they're in, in a closed room. They can't have locks on the doors. Uh, there are other certain requirements, but it's just the front windows of the establishment that can't be blocked. Right. So, so um, I, I, I saw a new, new, new place going up, and I'm sure they're, they're a great business uh, right next to the UPS store, and they already covered their windows. So do they have, shortly after they, open up the basement the city says welcome to Morgan Hill we have to remove all that yes sir and that might just be you know how they put up the white tape when they're under construction so I saw that as well no it has to be a local but I think it's the white construction um, you know so people don't see what they're doing construction wise but that will come down once they open up okay that's actually good uh, my answer I, I wonder if that's a little bit too or three got it I mean, that doesn't tell you anything whether or not what's going on behind those walls. Can we ask Chief Housegrove or Captain Ramirez to come forward and talk about the importance of the um, opaqueness? Okay, and while they're coming up, I will say that's best practice is followed by other communities. I mean, that, that, that might well be, I, you know, I, bear with me, I've never been in one of those places. Voting Council, Captain Ramirez with the Memorial Peace Department. So the reason for the opaqueness is, um, but what we're trying to also curb here is human trafficking. 
and the individuals that are being trafficked within some of these businesses. And so the best practice and standard issues is to have a front line open as a deterrent for individuals that are engaging in that type of behavior, not to want to go in and be seen in those establishments. So that's part of it. It's an industry standard across the best practices from the massage therapy council. Okay. I, I, I respect your opinion on that one. Yes, sir. Um, the, the other thing I'd like uh, to trigger my interest, uh, why are we asking for uh, passport and driver's licenses? For, why not just a simple ID? Oh, sure. So, so not everyone has uh, the driver's license, so yeah. we're asking for some type of form of government ID. Okay, so that's why it's either a driver's license or a passport. But, but if, maybe that person doesn't drive a car, so she has a regular ID, why wouldn't that be okay? The regular California is fine as well. Well, I bring it up because that's not what's mentioned. Right. Yeah. But we're looking for an actual government issued ID as well. Okay. I think we should work it that way. <coughs> you know, that is, I hope it makes sense what I'm trying to say, right? The, um, did, did you get any feedback from our businesses? The businesses that Brittany's been in contact, the only feedback um, that we've gotten or concerns that we've heard was the question was, is the fee going up? And the answer was no. And everybody else has been, that we've heard from, has been asking questions about how do I file, what steps do I need to take, who do I send it to? And coming back to the employees, that, that, so every employee needs will be checked somehow, but, but employees do come and go. So, but by the, by the time, at that time they have the license. So, so do you, every time they get a new employee, they have to run that by the police department? <coughs> That's correct. But again, we're trying to curb the human trafficking of individuals going from one part of the to the next. So we've seen uh, within talking with our district attorney about the human trafficking team that goes out and uh, provides resources to those individuals that have been doing human traffic and victims. We're trying to curb that and not make sure that it's not happening here in the city. And so what we've seen you know, in the industry is they get just moved from one parlor to the next. So if one parlor does get shut down in, say, another city, and they just move the individuals here. And so we're trying to curb all that to make sure that the individual owner knows that, well, when we're asking for them to identify who's there, we know who's, at, who's there, and they're not being used, then just be moved around from one to the next. So, so you're maintaining a list of of employees that were arrested in the past, or, or how do you determine? So, if you get an idea, how do you determine what right. you do with it? So, when the initial application has a section for them to list all employees, and then they also have to provide all of the employees' uh, California Massage Lottery Council ID, uh, and then when inspection is done by the police department or code enforcement, we're able to go in and see who that list of employees are on there. And, by volume, also have to post all of the massage uh, therapists within the business uh, in the lobby. So if we go there and find somebody that's not on our list of listed employees, then we know that individual in contact is to add that person to their to their list of employees. Okay. And I would say that that's already that's consistent with state law. The only difference is that we haven't enforced that. Um, so under state law, they they have to keep a list of their employees and their massage certificates and. Um, the reason for the ID is so that we can make sure that the person who is holding the massage certificate is actually the person that certificate was issued to. And, and, and how realistic is it to assume that the, the bad actor, if, I guess there will be some, that they actually follow that process? Well, the hope is if um, with the extra requirements we're now imposing on the massage uh, established that we kind of stop those bad actors, we will be able to go in and identify who the owners are. As uh, the attorney, attorney said earlier, a lot of times we're like straw owners, so we're trying to really find the individuals. Um, we don't look at the individuals that are performing the act. They're more of the human, uh, human trafficking victims, and so uh, our approach at the police department has changed from the undercover operations teams um, to be more of a resource provider to them and being able to go after the individuals who are trafficking them, essentially. I'd like to add to that that uh, the district attorney's office and the sheriff's department both have uh, human trafficking task forces due to the uh, increase 
of these massage parlors um, using women to perform these illegal services. Uh, we found 14 illegal uh, massage parlors uh, being advertised on the black web uh, in Morgan Hill. And so this is a very uh, real problem uh, and concern that we have regarding these victims. It's organized crime and they have such a vast network in the area that they move women, usually women, from state to state. And so uh, while we can't, and it's not right to prosecute the women who are being trafficked, uh, we do need to have something in place to uh, shut down these uh, organized crime locations. And that's what we're after, not the legal ones. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I hope we'll go after the elements and not the, the victims in, in here, because I, I think we want to protect primarily those women, of course, let, let's get frank, that, that's what we talk about here. The, you know, on the other hand, of course, I, I don't want to hurt the businesses that do do everything right and are needed and do a great job, and, 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 and so, you know, there's both sides of, of, of things, right? And I, I just hope that we, we find the right balance, right, in, 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 in a good process. Um, do you, do you also, and I guess I should just answer my next question, uh, because in preparation of tonight, I kind of Googled around, because I really have never been to any of those bosses, so uh, it's fairly easy to find bad actors. Uh, anyway, I mean, you just Google it, and it tells you. Uh, um, do you do that as well, and then you go after them? Yes, but again, it's challenging to find the person responsible, and so, uh, well, we could find the person committing the act. Uh, that's not the person that we need to go after to stop the organized crime. And so uh, this is a uh, better tool to prevent this from happening uh, in Morgan Hill, especially uh, when we do finally find uh, the person responsible. They just transfer the ownership of that massage parlor to another person in the organized crime, and they continue to run the, the illegal activities. So how do you know that the person who applies for the license is actually the real owner? I, I think the short answer is, is we don't. I mean, we, we don't know where the funding is coming from, um, and which is the reason for all of the other requirements that we put in here. Um, I don't believe that this is a burden to um, you know, a legitimate day spa that provides massage service. Um, they do all, all the things we're asking, they do already. Um, so it's not, the only thing that might be a little bit more burdensome is we have a much more detailed application now. Um, and we're asking questions that we hadn't always asked, but, uh, but, but otherwise, the, the actual requirements for the maintenance requirements, and safety requirements are all things that you know, a good massage place, a good massage establishment will already do. Right, right. At the end of the day, you talk about some sort of organized crime here, right? They, they, they do that in every stadium. They probably own several places and rotate, and I don't know what they can do. And money laundering and all that stuff could happen, right? And, 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 and I just wonder if those processes even help to find, and find what you're actually looking for, right? It is how uh, there are other cities within our county that have this uh, very similar ordinance in place. Uh, they work with the district attorney's office to prosecute individuals uh, and shut down rates uh, all up and down the state. <coughs> they will have a Southern California as well that is operating out here in Northern California. And I would suggest that if we did curtail the number of illegal consult partners, that uh, it would benefit the legitimate ones as well. <coughs> all right, thank you all. Thank you. Councilmember uh, Borjoli. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Matt, you said there is no fee increase, but it sounds like there's a great deal of uh, process uh, increases, especially time staff. So how will the cost recovery that? So on the, on the front end for the business to provide the, the documentation and complete the permit, there's an upfront time and effort for them. Um, you know, the, the PD still has to do their review, but if the applicant provides all the documentation, the document, documentation matches up, they go through their review process. And there is a fee recovery, um, the initial fee for, you know, an 
an application of $1,076, so it's not insignificant. Okay. Um, just one question for our police uh, department. Can a bad actor infiltrate, infiltrate um, a good establishment? Like the actual owner or like the... No, no, so you have an owner of a, a massage uh, business and then she hires or he hires uh, an employee can, um, and that employee has all the credentials, but the employee is doing nefarious work uh, in that private room. Absolutely, but I think what we see with the ones that are uh, doing everything right, following the law, they'll be able to identify that employee on their own and take corrective action because it is a bad, it would be a bad look for their business, but we see those individuals that are following the current law and already set in place, we take the corrective action uh, really quick before we can get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I, again, I have another question based on what Councilman Gorgio only asked. So let's say that that scenario played out. Does the owner of that establishment have a way of reporting that employee who done something nefarious and making sure that they are now identified in the system? Yes, so they can just notify the California Massage Therapy Council and then from there they will be able to put a restriction on either revoke their actual license to the California Massage Therapy Council or put a restriction. So when we do a background check for and contact uh, the council, we'll be able to let us know any activity on that uh, individual specific license. Got it. Thank you. Okay, no other questions. We will go to uh, open it to uh, public comment. Do you have any anyone from the public wishing to speak? Okay, we'll close the public comment. Uh, again, there's not being any further council discussion. Uh, we will look for a uh, motion to uh, waive the first and second reading of the ordinance and then to introduce a new ordinance replacing chapter 5.32, uh, massage establishment and massage professionals permit requirements. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. I think we have to separate. Do we have to do it individually? So one at a time. Okay, so we're at uh, number one, waive the first and second reading. I have a motion by Councilmember Borgio, second by Councilmember Spring. Uh, we will do a roll call. Uh, next one. Good. Okay. Uh, introduce new, well, let's see, all in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Being none, that passes 4 0. And so, uh, number two, introduce new ordinance replacing Chapter 5.32. Do I have a uh, motion? So, Mayor, oh, go ahead. Sorry. You have to read it first, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to. We have a motion. And a second by Councilmember Spring. Uh, we'll do the roll call. I'll read the title. Read the title and do the roll. We'll get through this. We'll get through this one. <laughs> <laughs> the city of Morgan Hill repealing and replacing Chapter 5.32 Massage Establishment and Massage Professionals Permit Requirement of Title V Business Licenses Generally to establish a permitting procedure for massage therapy establishments and services. Mayor Turner. Yes. Councilmember Spring. Yes. Weavers. Aye. And Borgio. Yes. Very good. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, item number 17, Sewers and Industrial Waste Ordinance Updates. Uh, the 
provision that requires us to, or, or the definition, some of the definitions needs to be updated, including uh, some of the local limit values <coughs> for the pollutants. And the reason for that change is because recently the South Central Regional Water uh, Wastewater Authority uh, got a visit of an audit from the uh, state requiring them to update their uh, sewer use ordinance. And because all of our sewer are treated at that location. As a result, we fall under the umbrella of that particular entity. Therefore, we need to update our ordinance as well. So, with that, uh, I'll go straight uh, to the, uh, what needed to happen with this. So, a few things that needs to happen is uh, update the certain definitions, like I said previously. Uh, that will allow our users to uh, get clarifications on some of the definitions. And the most critical thing about that is we are trying to get uniformity between the two entities. And the reason for that, the first part of it is that staff from that wastewater plan, enforce and, uh, or administer the program that we have here. It's called the pre-treatment program. So for that reason, and because all of our pollutants goes to be treated there, certain pollutants level need to be administered. And they are the one doing that, so our ordinance need to be uh, in compliance with what the state required them to be. So, with that, uh, I will go to the next uh, slide, which uh, pretty much go over what I just uh, explained uh, to you. It shows that the uh, SCAR, which is the South County Regional Wastewater Authority, uh, is the entity that uh, actually uh, those of those type of uh, pre-treatment program for us uh, and also allow us to be able to uh, it allow us to be able to be in compliance with the state as well so as I mentioned before, the, the changes uh, will minimally impact the, uh, the changes that we are requesting to make to that uh, particular audience. What type of changes uh, will that be impacting uh, the end users? No, the answer to that is no. It will not impact them drastically. But uh, what that, those changes will do is help protect our infrastructure and it will help us with the, the type of uh, sludge quality that the plant put out. Also, we help with the water quality that uh, is the end result of the water discharge that's being used for, say, irrigation. Less uh, pollutant will be uh, removed, more pollutants will be removed from those uh, uh, wastewater. The end user will be less affected by chemicals. Say, for example, the staff that are taking care of our collection system. The staff that work at the wastewater treatment plant, all of, them, all of those uh, uh, staff will be protected by reducing or eliminating some of those pollutants. Our next slide show actual tables of the pollutants that are being uh, uh, modified or introduced. 
if you look at the actual uh, light shaded green uh, table, there's an old one, those are the old uh, values that's being replaced. And on the new, on the right most uh, column, you will see the uh, new data that are uh, being either modified or being reduced. As you can see, uh, quite a few of those, uh, about six of them, uh, are being uh, changed. Uh, you can see the value for arsenic, for example, is it's being uh, reduced from a 1.1 to a 0.88. And there are three of those that are being changed. And there are also a new value that's being added. And that is, uh, one of them would be, for example, chloride. And you can see the unit there is 2,900. We didn't have that uh, uh, previously. So those are the changes that uh, we are asking you tonight uh, to review. Uh, what our recommendation is, is to first waive uh, the first and second reading for the ordinance, and second, introduce ordinance updating the city's uh, sewer use provisions. With that, I would take uh, any questions you have. Very good, thank you. Any questions by the council, council member Spring? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'm a member of the Squaw Board, uh, as is my colleague Martinez Beltran. I'm also its uh, chair this year. So, so in January and in April, uh, uh, the Squaw Board, as authority of, of the sewer plan uh, in, in Gilroy, went through this process and approved this. This order. so so for us here as council, it, this basically is a this is housekeeping to make sure we're we're. we're Right. Keeping, uh, in aligning, uh, will be in and will be aligned with what was described up our us in Gilroy. The city of Gilroy will have to do the same if they haven't done that. That's correct understanding, right? I, uh, I know that uh, the board has already approved uh, uh, the change uh, for square itself. Uh, city of Gilroy, the last I understand, they didn't have an ordinance. I think they used square. It seems, so uh, I'm not positive on that, but uh, uh, we have an ordinance and we have to follow suit because we fall under the umbrella. Right, right, I'm well aware of that. So it's really a housekeeping item. Right? I, I just bring it up as a question so that also the public understands the, the, the real authority is the, the, the scrawl joint power authority that owns the, and manages the sewer plant in Gilroy for Morgan Hill and Gilroy. Yeah. The plan is called by both cities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was helpful. Anyone else? No other questions. Uh, we'll open for public comment. Okay. None. We'll close the public comment, and uh, since there's no need for uh, council discussion, uh, the recommendation here is to waive the first and second reading of the ordinance. We have a motion to do so. Motion by Councilmember Borgiola. Second by Councilmember Spring. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Being none. Passes 4 0. Item number two, introduce ordinance updating the city's sewer use provisions. So I have a motion to approve. Motion, to motion by Councilmember Borgioli. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Spring. Uh, Michelle, would you read the ordinance and take the roll? In order to the city of Morgan Hill amending section 13.20.030 definitions and section 13.20.090 specific pollutant limitations of chapter 13.20 sewers and industrial waste of title 13 public services to regulate sewer use and set uniform requirements for discharges into the wastewater collection and treatment system. Mayor Turner? Yes. Council member Spring? Yes. Beavers? Aye. Borgiel? Yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Item 18, receive the monthly budget update, March 2024 financial and investment reports. I have to move you to the front of the agenda. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Dan Lee, uh, Science Director. Uh, I tried to be brief on this uh, item. As uh, C. Mentioned, mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to release 
Zoom's working on the, uh, we've been working on the uh, finalizing budget and we uh, plan to release them uh, next week. So uh, I want to steal the thunder from the team. But uh, overall, uh, so uh, for this year, uh, as of March 31st, the third quarter ended March 31st, 2024. Uh, pretty much nothing has been changed since we last presented you, uh, I believe, in, uh, in, in March. Uh, first, I will go over some of the uh, uh, major general funds, which includes uh, general fund. Uh, as of now, as I mentioned, uh, there's nothing to uh, not, uh, recommend any budget adjustment at this time. Uh, uh, so far, the property tax is trending uh, as we slightly as we uh, had uh, budgeted, uh, but there's an offset by the slightly double division to our uh, sales tax revenue, and expenditures are currently uh, tracking budget. Uh, as of uh, today as well. Um, for the public services, uh, this is not uh, something that uh, new. Uh, Revenues are currently tracking below budget for the current year. Um, and the team is currently busy working on the updating fee schedule. Uh, to bring that to you uh, sometime uh, right after the uh, budget release, uh, hopefully in the early summer. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we still expect that uh, this fund for the current year uh, we need some some sort of a short term internal funding uh, to uh, carry over the uh, I mean just to uh, until the new fees is uh, adopted and then uh, the economy especially on the development activity to uh, return to back to normal and uh, while expenditure expenditures are tracking uh, slightly actually slightly better budget so the offset on the uh, reduce uh, revenue from the and the slightly uh, uh, better than expenditure expenditures is slightly less than uh, than the overall revenue reduction. And as for enterprise funds uh, for wealth consumption, uh, through the uh, first nine months of the year, our residents consume about 3% less compared to prior two year average. Uh, both of the uh, revenue and expenditures for the uh, operation of the sewer and, uh, uh, and water are tracking budget. And uh, this graph reflects uh, no change since uh, last year, I've seen, seen them in the uh, in January and uh, March, uh, we still uh, at the high level at the uh, return from reserve uh, currently, but expected to expand down uh, in the next uh, few years. And you will find this uh, more updated uh, uh, in the next week when we release the budget. And that concludes my short presentation. I'm uh, happy to answer any question that you have or get hold up until the budget is released. Very good, thank you. Any questions, Councilmember Borgio? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Now it's good seeing you in a tie. So revenues are tracking below budget in what areas? Uh, this is mostly for the uh, Development Services Fund, uh, Fund 206. Uh, that's a fund that we uh, charge the uh, developer for the uh, uh, permits or the uh, design as well as inspection. And uh, uh, is that some of the reasons why the fund will need some short-term internal borrowing? Yes, that's correct. Uh, the fund is supposed to be self-funded uh, mostly by developers with the uh, support, of course, from the chum, some of the uh, general city services that the general fund need to uh, support. But overall, the fund is uh, to be to uh, uh, support by the charges that we charge to uh, any development or developers uh, to uh, make the fund for to fund the uh, expenditures uh, services that we provide. But uh, as of uh, this year, we uh, anticipate that uh, due to combination of uh, uh, deferring projects, as well as the tight projects, uh, and the carryover from the uh, basically uh, net uh, uh, deficit in the prior years, so that uh, com combination of those uh, probably result in uh, a, a, a need of the uh, uh, short-term borrowing to to make it, uh, the uh, the fund uh, uh, at the uh, uh, net zero. Thank you, Nat. Thank you, Mayor. Any other questions, Council Member Spring? Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, I was looking into uh, so on with regards to the general fund. That slide that you have, the property tax revenue is higher than budgeted right now uh, and the sales tax revenue is lower. The, I looked at the actual data compared to the budget last year, so, so the sales tax revenue is only 80,000 
dollars less right now compared to the prior year. But the property tax revenue is actually three hundred fifty thousand more compared to prior year. So, so, so that's like, to me that that's not slightly higher. That's actually significantly higher, uh, uh, which is a good thing, right? Yes, it is a good thing. But uh, remember that when you compare to uh, when we budget or we uh, when we plan for the current year, uh, the budget is of course uh, uh, if the, the growth continue. Uh, then the budget years are supposed to be higher than prior year. That's why when compared to prior year, they may be higher, but when compared to budget, they may be less, uh, in this case, uh, for sales tax, for instance. Right, right. So, so property tax didn't surprise me, what I would expect when you look around town, town right, that that is going up. Uh, do, you, do you think that trend will continue throughout the rest of the, the year? Uh, Again, I want to see the thunder, but overall, I think um, from the monthly uh, data that the county uh, sent to us, uh, we do anticipate that uh, uh, property tax at least continue to uh, grow at least at the level that uh, we have experienced uh, last year. But it will be hard to uh, you know to predict uh, uh, any time timeline longer than that because uh, with the economy and high interest rates, uh, anything could happen. Uh, as for sales tax, we do get an update from the consultant quarterly, and we just based on the latest estimate from our uh, sales tax consultant. Okay. The, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that when we talk about the budget then, but the, the, again, I'm not pretty much worried yet about this eight, being $80,000 off on sales tax revenue, uh, unless you tell me this is just the start of a big downtrain. Uh, well, well, yes. Uh, and I think we we are read uh, we are read the same uh, news that uh, released by the uh, the uh, statistical uh, uh, so far. And I think the consumer is still very resilient. But the, the uh, for us right here is that uh, even though sales tax may be uh, higher when compared to uh, prior year, but they are uh, slightly lower than we had forecast for. Well, basically, uh, the growth rate is not half as high as when we say the cost of the of the service that we provide. Right, uh, and I think you're doing the right thing. I got to know you over the years. You're family conservative with, with the budgets, right? And for for good reasons, right? And we, we always want to do better than uh, what you budget. The, but did you of those eighty thousand that are less than budgeted sales tax revenue that came in less? Do you is, is there a trend? Is it, is it is it one? Is it grocery stores? Is it car sales? What is it? Uh, based on the latest quarter, uh, we, we see that uh, I think we could uh, for those who shop in car for new cars, you could see the uh, softening of the uh, of, uh, new car sales. Uh, you see that in the past, I would say, if you look at the go-to shopping car last year, you will expect to pay higher than the manufacturing suggest, suggest, MSRP, manufacturing suggest retail price. But now, uh, I'm sure that uh, you could go up and do, do any dealership and uh, bargain for or make the uh, ask for a lower price than MSRP. Uh, but the, the trend overall is the, the consumers still spending, but uh, there's, uh, the worries are there. I think you could read uh, any uh, the polls, how many voters that uh, go out there. They, even though uh, the in quote unquote the actual realistic economy is uh, still growing, but uh, there are, uh, of course uh, there is um, underneath that there are some uh, worries, worries some from the consumers. Okay, in my predictions over the past few years have been pretty accurate. You must admit, right? Yes, uh, I guess you definitely. Uh, I should come to the bank as well. I said no one, no one would have predicted that, uh, that when we went through in uh, 2020, that we would bounce back. I was pretty much alone when I said we were going to have a quick recovery, and we did. Um, so, what is your assessment with, without me putting you too much on the spot? Are, 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 are we still okay? I would say that in the uh, short term, uh, we are doing fine, doing okay, just because that we come in at the uh, uh, high level of reserve. Of course, because of the actions that uh, you have taken, uh, very uh, wise action you have taken. But uh, for the uh, long term, um, 
it worries me because uh, can, uh, the inflation continues to be elevated, and uh, certain uh, some segment our revenues are not uh, you know catching up to the uh, the rate of inflation, and sell tax is uh, this uh, is a good, uh, good example. Right, but, but and correct me if I'm wrong, but is it also fair to say that that in, in the budget we never we don't include revenues coming in from businesses yet to come in, right? That we know they're somewhere in the pipeline. We do. Uh, we work closely uh, at quality meeting with the sales and development where we work closely with the economic, economic development team. Uh, they do have a better picture of uh, what's coming in and what's uh, on the horizon. And we do build that in, uh, we tell that to our self assessment consultant so the, he or she can build that in their uh, uh, in the uh, projection. Right, but in your actual budget, if they were comparing it against our, our numbers, but I'm just using it hypothetically, next year a new car dealership were to open up. Are those numbers considered already or not yet? That would be a, definitely a uh, positive impact <coughs> and uh, something that we... Right, of course, that point, but if our numbers... Yes, that would be... Considered in, in your budget already or not? No. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say, the not, right? So Until we know that there's a high likelihood and they're going to open their doors. So we we got two, two more, 20 more businesses opening up, doing great business, the, the, the trend line would change again, right? Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, could you go to that, that slide that shows that downward trend that we're, and again, on what uh, Councilmember Member Spring is saying. Question being, what do we need to do to that blue line to get that going? Uh, basically, uh, get more business coming in to the city. Uh, new business that generate uh, uh, tax uh, revenue uh, positive, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, control our uh, expenditures. Right. More businesses, retail, sales tax. Yeah, definitely. Hotel. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? There being none, we'll uh, go to the public. Any? Public comments? Yeah. Being none, we'll close the public comment. And uh, if there's no other discussion, we'll receive the report. There's no action on this. We'll just receive the report. That, thank you so much. Uh, item 19, proposed future council initiated agenda items. Uh, Christina, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this part of the agenda um, is going through the items that have been previously brought forward by council members um, to be uh, considered by the council. So this is basically the second step in the process. So the first step is the council member brings it up um, on the next item that we'll deal with, which is uh, future agenda items. And so these items have been brought forward, and so we're going to go through them. And so I'm going to put the first two together. So appointing versus electing the city treasurer and creating term limits for the city treasurer. And so this is an item that was brought forward by council member Levers, and she requested a discussion on uh, appointing versus electing the city treasurer and so appointing versus electing a city treasurer can have various impl implications depending on the context and the needs of the city and so just some um, uh, things to consider about appointing a city treasurer um, looking at the expertise and qualifications that an appointed city treasurer would have accountability to the city manager stability continuity efficiency in the selection process and no additional cost as the finance director could serve in this capacity Currently, we have an elected city treasurer, and so um, some of the thought processes why a city would have an elected city treasurer relate to democratic representation, independence from political influence, and encouraging competition. And so we're seeking direction from council tonight on whether the council would like to agendize this item for a formal discussion at a future meeting, so basically the third step in the process. Um, and so hand in hand with this is item number two. So if the council um, ends up wanting to uh, keep the treasurer as elected, then the item for discussion potentially is whether or not to create term limits like the council has decided to put on the ballot related to the mayor and council members. And so um, basically we're asking council whether or not they'd like to agendize this item for formal discussion in the future. And so what we'll do now is Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you and you'll turn it over to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Levers to um, kind of talk about the reason why she brought these forward. Very good. Council Member Levers. Yes. Thank you very much for bringing this back. Um, I just believe that I, instead of just one person running 
for the election of the treasurer. There should be open competition that we should have, uh, that instead, we should make sure the person is really qualified, that their background is in finance. And I really tend to think it should be uh, our city doing it. I don't think we need an elected treasurer. That's what I'm saying, because we could have unqualified people running with not anybody qualified running, and then we'd end up you know, with an unqualified candidate. So that's why I think it should be appointed, and I think it should be um, appointed by someone on the city staff. Also, I do think if it does go to an elected, I think it should be on the same term limits in case you know, they, in case the person isn't qualified, he has a way to, the community has a way to vote them out. So. Okay, so the discussion really here is do we want to go to step three and have a deeper discussion with the uh, city staff doing a, uh, a city of record report that we can then discuss and then determine do, does the council want to stay with an elected position or go to an appointed position, which at that point would be yeah. Uh, so, do we any thoughts on? And, and just a reminder: this is not a this is not debate. It's right. It's just a, it's really just a question of the city council interested in bringing it back. Correct. That's correct. Any thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we went through the process what, four or five years ago. Yeah. For the two, uh, November 2018 ballot, there was discussion of whether or not to include that at the time that we had city. Uh, but we decided to not move forward. So I, I, I completely agree with my colleague, Lee Burst. Uh, I, I think we're, I, I don't know if our current treasurer will run again uh, or would run again, uh, but, but uh, I don't think there will be much complication of having to find one person wanting to do that. So I, I just think it would make sense to point that uh, and ask our voters uh, whether or not they will be okay. Again, tonight, what we're just deciding here, though, yeah. we want to go step I, I, Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we want to avoid. Yes, exactly. Debate on it. Right. So let's just just go to that. Do we uh, do we need to formalize this with a motion and a vote? You know, do it that way. Or just I, I'm I'm fine with trouble. Okay. How many of us want to bring this back for uh, for further discussion? I'm good with it. Obviously. And and Council Member Springer good with bringing it back. Yeah. Two two vote. Yep. Okay. So we'll go ahead and I'll come back at a future date. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. Um, item number three. Okay, great. So the next item is brought forward by Councilmember Morgioli, and then, so this is a discussion for the council to consider discussion on a policy to prevent the council from taking positions on foreign or international events. And so we're looking for direction from council if they want this to go to the third step and have a discussion limiting the uh, conversations and decisions that come before council. Thank you, Councilmember Morgioli. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, uh, I sent in uh, supplemental material on this, and it's um, somewhat uh, quite extensive, and it defines what we should really concentrate on and, and maybe not concentrate on. Uh, and I gave examples in the supplemental item that we um, that I submitted. So I'm not going to repeat that. I'm hoping that my colleagues did read that material. But, but then I, I further looked at the uh, sustainable Morgan Hill document. And you know, I, I kind of realized, uh, you know, we, we already have a lot of what we should do and not do in this sustainable Morgan Hill document. Uh, for example, uh, the ongoing uh, city council priorities you know, enhancing public safety and quality of life, um, maintaining and enhancing infrastructure. And I can go on with these priorities, but the point is we, we have a lot of what we should and should not do in this sustainable Morgan Hill document. Uh, and strategic priorities, fiscal sustainability, again, if it doesn't pertain to these priorities that we've already established out there, in addition to, uh, again, I, I definitively outlined uh, some criteria of uh, what we shouldn't concentrate on in supplemental material. Uh, I, I think we really need a discussion so as 
not to have an item like on March 6th where we entertained something and it got truly out of hand and um, what that did though, it cost the city uh, close to $10,000 in taxpayer money, needlessly. Uh, so it was 7,500 just in police protection for that one item, and, and uh, about 2,500 in other staff, additional staff, and uh, discussions and meetings. Uh, so I think we really got to be very careful spending taxpayer money, uh, or wasting taxpayer money, like on the March 6th uh, meeting. So I, I really feel that we need to bring this back and have a discussion so we could uh, more pinpoint what we should and should not bring forward as a, an agenda. <coughs> okay, very good. So the what's before us is do we want to now go to step three with this particular item? Uh, if you have any thoughts on that, we'll, again, we're not going to get into the debate about uh, the item itself, but uh, I, I would be good with bringing that forward. Marilyn, Gina. Yeah, I, I, I struggle. I understand where you're coming from, but you know, that, that can be a domestic issue. Uh, just as a controversial ever, you might have the same expenditure being had those evenings to you know, remember some of those days. Uh, and again, you know, what is international versus domestic? The COVID crisis came from from somewhere uh, in Iran, right? so we shouldn't have talked about it. Uh, global warming. We don't want to talk about it. But, uh, I, I struggle where 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 to define it. We can have the discussion. I'm okay with that. But I think it will be very hard to to narrow it down. Especially, uh, you know, I'm the only immigrant on, on this council. Uh, some of us have families in other areas of the world that are maybe more impacted with some of what's happening in the world. Uh, and, and, and but we live here in this community and are impacted and. and, and of course, then we want our uh, council and others to take a stand and say something or do something. And so just saying, we're not going to listen to you. We should not have made this as a comment on the But on the subject on the, when the, we went over with this discussion on the substance of the request and just whether or not it's worth it. Yeah, so, so I'm okay to go with it, but I, we have to be very careful how we limit anything. So that being the case, we will move forward with that. I don't have come back at a future future council, uh, council meeting. And for the, the, the service policy for city council meetings. Got it. So um, this particular one, um, we have in the past brought forward a code of conduct policy for public meetings, and we did that after Governor Newsom, Newsom signed into law SB 1100, and so we provided a potential draft of a policy. Um, and, and following that, the council decided not to move forward with the conduct policy. Um, however, then the, at the February 21st meeting, Council Member Morgioli requested the council revisit it and develop a policy on disturbances within the council chamber during council meetings to prevent unacceptable behaviors. Um, and so we're seeking direction on whether or not the council wants us to come back and look at um, establishing a policy. Very good, Council Member Morgioli. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So again, uh, the March 6th uh, City Council meeting, I think, was uh, an eye-opener for all of us and taught many of us uh, a lesson on uh, being not respectful and uncivil and uh, distracting. And so um, I, uh, in, in my supplemental that I supplied, you know, I gave, for example, three items and some of which is already in uh, a policy that we try to bring forward. Um, uh, so, for example, when the mayor did the proclamations, you know, people clapped and they did it respectfully, and, and that was okay. Well, if you really noticed uh, in a couple of past meetings recently, um, you know, there was uh, a person in the audience you know, really go, yes, yes, yeah, 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 and he calls out a uh, council member. That's something that could be intimidating to another person sitting next to him or her. And so I, I think you have to look at it like, uh, is that person disturbing another person in the audience or intimidating another person by their actions? So I think we have to limit those types 
things. And, uh, and I just set an example of the outburst. The outburst like that, which we've had, could intimidate others from speaking. So um, I, would, I would really like to bring this forward as the next step and at the March 6th uh, meeting, uh, you know, there were, there were cards, you know, pretty big cards, and, and they were being held up, and they were hand raising, and when you go to the podium, uh, there's no cards should be at the podium, only a piece of paper to read from, and they brought items up at the podium. So I think we need again to spell out a policy on, and I think we need to show, you know, how, how to be respectful and civil and, and, and cordial in a business meeting like a city council meeting. So I'd like to bring this forward based on that. Then I've got a couple questions for you on, on an item like this. First of all, what I don't want to do is go back into the council room because I don't want to have that discussion again. If this is different, then I'd be open open to it, but I also want to be sure that, I mean, let's use the example that Council Member Borgioli just brought up. Somebody, somebody in the audience is, is, you know, carrying on. Let's say we have this policy. What does that even give us? That's so, I, I appreciate the question. I want to make sure we're not getting into the subject matter. Oh, I, I want to as well. I, because, but, but I'll, I'll answer that question. Sure, I got that. 